Well, I want to tell you I've been both excited and challenged by this invitation from Tuck and this series called Lord of the Rings as it has approached. Because on the one hand, I'm excited at the prospect for all of us who are married or all who are planning toward or one day hope to be married to see the implications and applications of discipleship to both marriage and family. But I want to say I'm also acutely aware that since marriage and family matters touch virtually every part of our lives, either directly or indirectly, expectations of such a series can be quite unrealistic. You all are such great encouragers. I mean, starting even last Sunday when it was confirmed I would be preaching this series, you know, great expectations already developed. Looking forward to what what I had to say. I hope I'm not too disappointing to you as we go. I'm a continued student in the education of marriage and family as well. Six weeks ago, Kim and I marked 46 years of marriage. Now, I know, thank you. I want to say it's probably 56 for Kim. It's longer. (laughs) Married to a preacher. Lynn could probably attest to that because, uh, you know, it's a challenge in unique ways. But we're still learning. What I can say is that of all the dreams and hopes and assumptions and even presumptions that we had on our wedding day when we responded to the question, do you, and we said, we do, we had no idea what we were committing ourselves to. Amen. Can you, can you relate to that as married, married folks? We had no idea the level of commitment it would take to keep this commitment, this, this covenant. Now, God's blessed us to do so, and I've been thoroughly blessed uh, with a, uh, a wife and uh, my favorite person and my best friend in marriage as we partnered together. But the whole daunting experience kind of reminds me of the story of um, family that went to church on one Sunday morning and their son dutifully went off to Sunday school class. But uh, even before class was over, the teacher's assistant came out and got the parents because the little boy was just, he was so upset. He was just inconsolable. And the parents went back, and when they finally got him settled down, they asked, what in the world is wrong? And he said, the teacher said today that God wants us all to live in Christian families, but I want to stay with you guys. I want to stay with you guys. You know, when it comes to marriage and family, as with any other subject, what we need to hear is a word from the Lord. Amen? Reminds me of another Bible class teacher who asked her class, who can tell me something Jesus said about marriage? And the little boy responded, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. (laughs) Kind of where we are. Given our expectations with marriage, we might think that God that the Godhead, the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit, would indeed have something to say. So in this first message, in this extended series that I'm actually going to be sharing with our brother David, as he will be speaking next week in my absence, I wanted to address the foundation of marriage and family that's recorded in Genesis with a message called From the Creator of the Rings. Let's read this scripture together. It's familiar, but as one preacher among us likes to say, familiar scripture needs to be read more closely. This is the record of the first marriage and family. The text says, the Lord God said, it is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. Now the Lord God had formed out of the ground all the wild animals and all the birds in the sky He brought them to the man to see what he would name them. And whatever the man called each living creature, that was its name. So the man gave names to all the livestock, the birds in the sky, and all the wild animals. But for Adam, no suitable helper was found. So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. And while he was sleeping... He took one of the man's ribs and then closed up the place with flesh. Then the Lord God made a woman 
from the rib he had taken out of the man, and he brought her to the man. The man said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. That is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife, and they become one flesh. And as many believe Moses is the author of Genesis, Moses concludes with this observation, Adam and his wife were both naked and neither felt shame. They felt no shame. I spoke earlier of the Godhead, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And it's important that we begin with a foundational passage such as the beginning of marriage and family because it sets the context for what we hear from Scripture concerning what the Trinity thought of marriage. And what we can conclude quite readily is that the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit, thought that marriage is holy, holy ground. Now, as we hear fuller expression of the thinking and the teachings of the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit, through God the Son, the Word become flesh, Jesus the Christ in the Gospels, it becomes clear that Jesus held a great reverence for marriage. And it was that reverence that he was representing the Trinity to share together. And even though he was single, that reverence becomes quite evident. It's quite significant, I think, that of all the miracle settings that Jesus could have chosen for his first, it turns out to be, at of all places, a wedding feast in Cana, where he turns water into wine and saves the day. I think there are at least a couple of reasons why Jesus had such a high view of marriage and expressed that on behalf of the Trinity. One of them is like we're saying here. Jesus knew that God had a high view. God the Father had a high view of marriage. Every time Jesus was asked about marriage, he would reference the first He would remind people that God created marriage. Marriage was God's idea, the Trinity's idea. Let us make man in our image. Those three, one together, created marriage and family. And they believed that it was a good idea. Sam Alberry is an author who has written prolifically about theological matters, one of which is from a book that he titled Connected, Living in the Light of the Trinity. It's an excellent read, and it's the connection between the Trinity and humanity, particularly with the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit's vision for how humanity is going to participate in his great kingdom enterprise. But this is what Albury writes about the Trinity's view and vision of marriage. He says, the relationships of the Trinity are relationships of love. Now we're talking about God. They are marked by devotion to others. Relationships for us, Albury says, easily become self-serving. Say amen when you have to. But the message of the Trinity is radically different. Self-centeredness poisons the healthy relationships for which we were made. Albury says, put it another way, we are not designed to find happiness in living for ourselves. We were created to enjoy a matrix of relationships in relationships uh, in which we rather can reflect the self-giving relationships of God the Trinity. He continues, Adam and Eve are the first man and wife. In them, we see the template of all future marriage. The oneness of God, Albury says, is the heavenly analog of the oneness of man and wife. By virtue of their marital union, man and woman are able to arrive at a kind of oneness 
that can reflect the oneness of the Trinity. I'm really helped by that statement to remember God's vision for not just humanity in general, but marriage in the family specifically and what we observe in the first marriage. You see, the Trinity intended for us to learn something deeply important from Adam and Eve in that very first marriage. Something deeply important about the nature of God and deeply important about the nature of us as human beings. And particularly human beings who are gendered, male and female. You see, marriage and family is the Trinity's penultimate creation. God loves marriage. God considers matrimony holy. I think it's quite amazing. Maybe you do as well. If you look back at Adam's response when God presented the woman to the man, for years I heard that preacher tone when I was hearing this as, as a boy. You know how the preacher tone goes when we read this passage? Adam said, this is now bones of my bones and this is now flesh of my flesh, right? No, no, that's not the spirit I now understand. I think Adam was fully human and he looked at the woman and he said, Wow, hubba, hubba, this is finally what I've been looking for. No more alone. Same but different. And notice what Moses records about these two and their marriage. Naked at least at this point in the narrative. But no, no shame. God had a high value and a high vision for marriage and how we experience oneness as mortals in the manner that the divinity of God, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit do. And I really think this is quite amazing when we look at this original marriage, considering the fact, think about it now, Eve was just a few hours old and Adam was recovering from major surgery. For them to be the ones that are held up as the penultimate example is nothing short of the wisdom of God. Scripture says in the Proverbs chapter 18, verse 22, the man who finds a wife finds a treasure and receives favor from the Lord. Now guys, I know that some of us consider ourselves to be gifts to women, but Solomon reminds us that a wife is God's gift to us. To be a married person is to have the favor of God upon us because God loves marriage. It was his idea. And so followers of Jesus should have a very high view of marriage. We should honor and protect the sacredness of marriage. Jesus knew that God had a high view of marriage and that we should as well. When I was thinking about this and with the Summer Olympics approaching, I was reminded of the Winter Olympics back in the 90s. Now, this is the 1990s. I'm not that old. And Carrie, Karen Lee Gardner, who was an Olympic gold medalist from Canada, who won in the downhill competition that particular year. After she was presented with her gold medal, an interviewer began to wrap up their discussion and she speculated to Gardner. She said, I imagine that this is the most important day in your life. And Gardner replied, no, no, that was the day I got married. But this, this is pretty cool too. I think God would like that answer. God had a high view of marriage and Jesus knew that the Father loved marriage. Second, we see that Jesus knew and taught that marriage was most closely resembling his relationship to the church. It's a prominent metaphor in both the Old Testament and the New 
that God is the husband, and in the Old Testament, particularly Israel, is the wife. In the New Testament, Christ is the bridegroom, and the church, we, the collective body of Christ, we are the spiritual bride of Christ. And so in Matthew 25, one of Jesus' more well-known parables to those who've read scripture about the bridegroom delaying and the attendants not being ready, right? Jesus is depicted as the bridegroom and his servants, his followers, the, the bride. And of course, Ephesians chapter 5, that familiar passage, that, that connection that Paul makes between husbands loving their wives and, and wives loving their husbands, being devoted to their husbands as a, a, an earthly mortal depiction of the spiritual relationship between Jesus the bridegroom and his church as the bride. We see this symbolism in scripture a great deal. It seems as though God is trying to communicate just how committed he is to those he has saved and called to follow him and Christ is their Lord. And Paul would put it this way at the end of that section in Ephesians 5. This is from the New Living Translation. Paul says, as the scriptures say, a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife and the two are united into one. Do you see that oneness? The oneness of God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit, the oneness of husband and wife. Paul concludes, yes, this is a great mystery, but it's an illustration of the way Christ and the church are one. So let me ask you, in that light, is it any wonder that Jesus' teaching on the sanctity of marriage upon the covenant of marriage and therefore his response when asked about divorce for any and every reason being as strong and staunch as it was. In fact, when Jesus stated when asked about the reasons for divorce that it becomes so prominent and common among the Jewish people because of the concession that Moses had made centuries before actually due to the hard-heartedness of the males who were in the position of control and dominance over the females and the children. When Jesus made that response and cleared it up once and for all, the disciples heard his answer and said, wow, if this is the situation between a husband and wife, it's better not to marry. In other words, this standard is so high and the ground under marriage is so holy, it'd be good for us not to do this as often as we do it. So we must interpret everything Jesus said about marriage in light of this lofty and holy standard. <clears throat> Listen to what he said to his disciples. Jesus replied, this is Matthew 9, 11, I'll read. Not everyone can accept this word, but only to those to whom it has been given. For some are eunuchs because they've been born that way. Others are made that way by men, and others have renounced marriage because of the kingdom of heaven. The one who can accept it should accept it. You see, I believe this passage with its lofty and holy standards set by Jesus is the place to begin. Connected back to Genesis chapter 2 and God's performance of the first covenanted relationship known today as marriage. I think we learn some other things from Jesus' teaching and, and we get windows into the insight and vision of the Godhead, the Trinity as well. And one of those is that we learn from the words that Jesus spoke that I just read, marriage is not for everyone. It's not for everyone. Jesus acknowledged that in Matthew 19. In fact, David is going to address this more specifically next week in a message speaking to those who are not married. And I regret that I'm not going to be here live, David, so I'll, I'll follow later uh, uh, and uh, be sure to pick up your great message from there. But I will say this at this moment about that, and David will build on it. Jesus placed the single life next to the married life as co-equal in dignity. 
And let's take note of this just for now in our study. The most spiritual, well-adjusted, whole person who ever walked the face of the earth was single. To deny Jesus singleness is to deny his humanity. Oh yes, marriage is a calling, but so is singleness. Uh, watch this face next week as David addresses those matters with us from Scripture. No, marriage is not for everyone, but it is for most. And that leads us next to understand that Jesus knew that marriage is here to stay. Marriage is here to stay. It's interesting where Jesus' next teaching about marriage shows up. It's actually in the context of teaching about the end of times. At the end of times, Jesus says, let me see if I got my, my slide here right. Oop, I'm going the wrong way. Oh, 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 oh. Help me out back there, preacher. I'm so sorry I messed things up. <laughs> That marriage is here to stay. That's where I wanted to be. Thank you. need to put my electronics down. It's interesting, like I said, where it shows up. In Matthew 24, beginning in verse 36, Jesus said about the end times, No one knows about that day or hour, not even the angels in heaven nor the Son, but only the Father. As it was in the days of Noah, so it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. For in the days... Before the flood, people were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage up to the day Noah entered the ark, and they knew nothing about what would happen until the flood came and took them all away. Jesus says, that's how it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. Jesus says, right up until the time he returns, people will be planning weddings. Because marriage is here to stay. Last year, 2.2 million people said, I do. Now we're praying that this year they're still saying, I still do, right? Kind of reminds me of the story about an older man visiting a retirement center. Four elderly widows were playing dominoes near the front desk as he came in. So they struck up a conversation with the man, and one woman said, what are you doing here? He replied, I'm checking in, going to live here. Second woman said, where are you from? He said, well, for the last 30 years, I was in prison. The third woman asked, well, what were you in prison for? He said, well, for murdering my wife. The fourth woman said, ah, so you're single. <laughs> Marriage is here, and it's here to stay. One of the interesting things about Jesus teaching about the end times is that marriage is normal, and that means lots and lots of weddings. But what Jesus acknowledges and knew that we haven't really acknowledged as a culture as we should is that God envisions, in fact, God mandates that marriage is permanent. Marriage is intended to be permanent. So in Matthew 19, when he's asked this question about divorce for any reason, Jesus goes all the way back to Genesis chapter 2. And he says, haven't you read that at the beginning the Creator made them male and female? So for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. So they're no longer two, but one. Therefore, this is not just what the pastor says at the end of the ceremony. This is what is commented on in Scripture. Therefore, what God has joined together let not man separate. God's vision is that we marry once for life. And he recognizes, he acknowledges, as did he with Moses and the law of Moses, the hard hearts that we can develop or the frailty or the flawed natures that we possess. But even then, that window for breaking a covenant is very, very narrow. Because God intends for marriage and family to be the foundation of culture and the strength of kingdom. 
and the vessel through whom he works to do his work in this world. Now, a bit later in the series, we're going to address the matters of when marriages fail and when we fail in God's forgiveness and what we must extend to one another. But I hope you see what I'm working to do is to help us reaffirm the value, the holiness, the sacredness with which the Scripture approaches marriage because God approaches marriages in this way. It's to be permanent. William Bennett, who was at the time Secretary of Education under President Reagan, wrote later a popular book called The Book of Virtues. And in it, he tells the story about attending a wedding in which the couple it had changed the vows from as, from as long as we both shall live to as long as we both shall love. You see the subtle but real difference there? Bennett said, as a housewarming gift, my wife and I sent them a stack of paper plates. <laughs> yeah. Now, to be sure, this series is about marriage, not about divorce. But I've got to mention that divorce is the exception to the vision that God has had for marriage. Jesus knew that marriage is permanent. So let me ask you as we wrap up this morning in our first installment, what do you think of marriage? What do you think of marriage? You know, there's no such thing as the perfect marriage. You know why? There's no such thing as a perfect couple. There's no such thing as a perfect person. You even look at Scripture and you'll see at best the marriages that are recorded are flawed, and at worst they are utterly sinful. And at times, ironically and sadly, that sinfulness is depicted and demonstrated in the lives of what appear to be otherwise faithful people in relationship to God. Abraham and David and others along the way, for example. No, we should not get the impression from Scripture that there are perfect marriages because they are not. There's no such thing. Nobody is compatible. In fact, Here's the best definition of marriage compatibility I've ever heard. One man wrote, marriage is when you agree to spend the rest of your life sleeping in a room next to a person that's too hot because you're too cold. <laughs> yes. No, there's no perfect ones. But what do you think of marriage? What do you think of your marriage? What do you think of your vision of marriage? It's so important that we carry God's vision into those relationships. And what we see depicted in the servanthood and the heart of Christ is to be replicated in our relationships and specifically our marriage relationships. There's a word from the cross for everyone in this room, married or not. Are you unmarried? Are you single? then you follow Jesus and you seek his kingdom. Are you in this room and you're married? Then you follow Jesus and you invest daily, weekly, monthly, year after year in your marriage. Are you here single again, having experienced the heartbreak and the hurt of a failed marriage? You follow Jesus and you receive his forgiveness, and you extend forgiveness. Are you here married again? Will you follow Jesus and you dedicate this marriage to the Lord? Are you in a challenged marriage? Is your marriage struggling just now? Or maybe we could add this. Would you find yourself in what might be described as a spiritually single marriage? 
in that you are the believer, but a spouse is not. And that creates particular challenges for you, not only in your marriage and family, but at times also in your faith. There's a good word from Jesus. There's a calling of grace and love and forgiveness and understanding and hope. You follow Jesus whether your mate does or not. The French essayist Husay once said this, tell me what you love and I will tell you who you are. Well, that's quite an insight, isn't it? Do we love marriage the way God loves marriage? Now on one level we have to say, no preacher, we don't because he's God and we're not. I hear that and I'm there with you. My question has more to do with, do we love marriage in the way that God wants us to love marriage? Do we love family the way God wants us to love family? And are we doing all that we can do to cherish that gift every day that we live? If not, you'll end up like my lawn shoes. Well, let me tell you about my mowing shoes. Generally, my kicks start out looking like the picture that you're seeing on top. I keep them white. I keep them clean. Uh, Those under 40 years old refer to them as dad shoes. I'm okay with that, right? But eventually what happens is those shoes of mine start to get too loose They get a little too comfortable. They get a little out of style or I don't want to keep up with them. Or what happens is they're the first things I grab when I'm going to the lawn and pretty soon they don't look like that top picture anymore and they become the bottom picture. I've got a pair on the top and I've got a pair on the bottom. And I'm starting to imagine now the time between when the top goes to the bottom. (laughs) Can that be how we end up valuing God's holy things? What starts out as sacred starts to, over time, fade and diminish, and it loses its luster. Or we forget, we get distracted, and, and we don't maintain the value and the strength. Don't let your marriage turn out like Mike's lawn shoes. Now that's a profound statement, isn't it? Let's make that which God sees as holy continue to be holy. God sees matrimony as holy. May we do so as well. That which has our affection will determine our direction. That which has our affection will determine our direction. We're going to build on this as we continue to Pull this thread of God being the Lord of marriage and family. I thank you for your time with me today. I look forward to what David's going to share with you. And Lord willing, I'll be back two Sundays from today on the 21st. A big shout out of thank you again to Tuck for this opportunity. And just now, if anyone desires to respond to the call of not just salvation, but lordship, of Jesus Christ. The elders are in the back to receive you if you'd like to pray. If there's something that we can assist you with, let it be known while together we stand and sing this song.